Hey, good morning, you guys. How are you? Doing good? All right, well, my name is Mark, and it's good to have you guys uh, here today. Good to be with you. Otherwise, I'd be all by myself standing on a platform. That would look pretty silly. Uh, but uh, now, you know, as we today we're going to be landing uh, this series uh, called Legacy. Before we get into it, I want to kind of bring you up to speed uh, on a few things uh, that are happening. Uh, number one, uh, this is the last week that you'll be sitting in these chairs. So, oh, yeah. Here's Hawaii. So this week, um, these chairs are all going to get packed up, and uh, we are shipping them to Haiti to uh, Pastor Julio Volsi, who's got, God has been doing an amazing thing through him. He oversees, yeah. He oversees Teen Challenge in Haiti, and he is all about raising up leaders uh, in the nation of Haiti, helping people to find freedom. They are, like, doing an amazing uh, work there. Uh, he's involved in numerous projects. They planted a church about 10 months ago. They got over 400 people at their church. And uh, just mobilizing young people who are making a difference. And uh, so we're going to give them our chairs, you guys. So uh, that's going to be fun. Um, so bring your own chairs next week. <laughs> if you could do matchy, matchy and make it look nice, we would really appreciate that. Uh, so, but we're going to be getting some uh, new chairs uh, coming in. Also, uh, the carpet is going to be not going to Haiti. That's just going in the dumpster. But... Uh, but the carpeting is going to be different. And, you know, it's important that we always create inviting environments where people can find hope. That's all that it's a part of. It's really about uh, creating a kind of space where people can go, ah, I feel like I could be a part of this. So uh, that's happening. Uh, so you're going to see all this is going to be different uh, next week. Also, um, Puerto Rico, what we have been doing is uh, doing a lot of research and just Special thanks to Isander Santiago, by the way, who was on base today. And, uh, and Isander has been doing a lot of research. We were looking at gathering supplies. We were looking at doing a big drive for all that stuff. He's really been pressing into this. And if you've seen the news, it's like they can't get th these things distributed. And so uh, as he kept looking, one of the things he realized was that the very best way for us to help Puerto Rico was by partnering with a work that's already doing something, and that is Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope was a part of Hurricane Katrina recovery, and it's a great faith-based uh, ministry. And a cool thing about Convoy of Hope is their administrative costs are very low. 90% of everything they get goes directly to aid. And so it's going to be more of a long-term thing. And so... Uh, so here's what we're going to do next week. Not do th we're not going to do it this week, but next week I want you to come ready because everything that uh, you give over and above our regularly budgeted needs, we're sending to Convoy of Hope to be a part of helping Puerto Rico rise up from uh, Hurricane Maria. So, so that's going to be good. So next week I want you to be prepared, keep your hearts open. To, uh, to all that. Also, I want a couple of thank yous. Uh, you guys continue to bring food in. Um, we've had such, we've had like small groups, we've had communities get together and people coming in and just bringing boatloads of food for the food bank. The food bank got depleted with the storms that have gone through. And so we want to be a part of uh, replenishing uh, and supplying for our community. So the, the uh, challenge that I put out was to go to the store, get those buy one, get one free deals of non-perishable goods, get some for you and your family, and then give the rest into the food bank uh, barrels right here. And then in November, they're going to get depleted again because it's the holidays. So then we'll take what we've stored up for ourselves and we will give it again and so we can double bless our community uh, through the Manatee Food Bank. So thank you guys. Many of you have been doing it. Don't forget, um, let's keep doing that. It's just going to be awesome. Also, I want to thank you because a few weeks ago, um, right after the storm, we talked about some lessons that we had learned coming out of it. One of those was we could really be in a better position uh, with a little bit of organization. And uh, we put the challenge out there and said, hey, if you are willing to be counted among those who are saying, I want to be a part of any relief work, any projects like that, uh, that we do, 20 to 25% of you guys signed up. I mean, that was really cool. 
That was really cool. And now some of you weren't here for that. And so if you go, hey, uh, count on me for that, um, you can take your contact uh, card and you can fill that out. On the back where there's prayer requests, if you write relief team, um, we will uh, add your name to the list and you can put that in the drop boxes. And that team, by the way, is being organized and it's going to be led. And uh, we may not wait for hurricanes. There are other things that we could be involved with um, that will be a part of helping our community. But we just want to uh, keep on making a difference in our community. And uh, so thank you guys who were a part of that already and uh, for those of you that are going to be signing up for that. Finally, um, I want to uh, uh, fill you in. Some people have said, hey, uh, like, whatever happened to the parking lot project? <laughs> like, it was a year ago when we talked about the fact that, uh, you know, people are parking in the ditches, people are parking all around, and we want to create parking space, uh, and we're going to knock down uh, two houses that are adjacent to us, clear out room behind Core Team Central. Uh, we actually... We're moving down that path. We continue to move down that path, and something called permitting happened. <laughs> and so that in, it gives enough to be said, right? Right. So, uh, and uh, but we're at the point where it looks like it's going to happen. Now, let me just say this: the delay was really a godsend because one of the key parts of that delay was we wanted to make sure that uh, the His Girls ministry, where we're giving women a second chance in life, that we were able to establish a home with them and have those 18 beds available for the ladies. That took longer than they thought it was going to take. And so the delays that we had actually provided the space and the time that uh, was needed anyway for all that to happen. So I, I guess God's got his own schedule to get everything done. So that served a purpose. I don't see the purpose from here forward, so I'm just angry now. So, um, but, uh, but how many of you discovered that, like, nothing ever happens in your timing, right? Right, clap. <laughs> Let's not clap for that one. That's like, I, I hate it. I hate. And there's always uncertainty, right? Your best plans, there's always uncertainty. You, you want there to be certainty. You've got good ideas, good intentions. You're looking forward, and there's still uncertainty no matter what you do. And sometimes it can be really discouraging. Sometimes you get setbacks in your plan that really make you get discouraged, and, and you can kind of get into a really unhealthy place trying to deal with uncertainty. But, but here's the, the truth. The truth is, is that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there's something that you have that a lot of you have not taken advantage of. You actually have the power to see beyond your circumstances. You have the power to, to, to see beyond the uncertainty that you're dealing with, and there are some things that you can know for certain, even in the midst of the struggle. And, and the Apostle Paul, he was in prison. He was in a dungeon. He's behind bars. He is stuck. He is uncertain about when he's going to get out. He's uncertain about whether he's even going to walk out or whether he's going to be put to death. He is uncertain about whether people are going to visit him and support him. He's uncertain about whether people are just going to take advantage of his time behind bars and elevate their role outside at his expense. He is uncertain about all of that stuff. But there's one thing that he was certain about. And, and in Philippians 1.6, you guys got these when you came in. The Apostle Paul, in spite of all the uncertainty that he was experiencing, said, but I'm certain, I am certain that he, that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished until it is fully done. He who began this work in you, his work within you, he's going to complete it. He's going he's to continue his work in you until it is finally finished on the day that Christ Jesus returns. He said, of all the uncertainty in life, 
He was able to see beyond his own pain. He was able to see beyond his own struggle. He was able to see beyond the bleakness of the situation that he was in. And by the power of God, he had the ability to see beyond his circumstances. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the same power. You have the same ability. So Philippians 1, 6, let's read this out loud together. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. He says, that's what I'm certain about. If there's one thing that I know is that God is going to make sure that things continue down the path according to his plan in your life. And so there are some things, most things in life that we're going to be uncertain about. And you may find yourself in a very uncertain situation right now. And so the question that you have to ask yourself and a question I have to ask myself is this. Are you more committed to the future or to the past? The Apostle Paul says, hey, even though I am in this dungeon, even though I'm uncertain about what's going to happen, I'm committed to the future. I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished when, on the day when Jesus Christ returns. He says, There's, they, I, I'm focused on the future. The question is, are you more focused on your future or are you more focused on your past? Are you, are you, are you looking forward? Or are you still living for what's behind you? Here's the truth. If you're going to build a legacy, if I'm going to build a legacy, the only way that we're going to be able to create the future with God is if we're looking forward and we're moving in that direction. You cannot create the future if you're busy wrapped up in your past. If you, are you still living with the messages that you grew up with of how insufficient you are, of how weak you are, of how you will fall short? Do you still rehearse the things, the hurtful things that were said to you? Do you live with that? Are you more committed to what God says about you or are you more committed to what people have told you? Are you more committed to who God says you are once you're forgiven Or are you more committed to the person you used to be? See, this is the beautiful thing about what Jesus has done. You see, Jesus, when when he came and he died on a cross to pay for for your sins and for my sins, he he paid for the, the penalty that you and I owe for the sins that we've committed. Why does he do that? Because he wants to unchain you from your past. But he didn't stop there. He died, and he's been raised from the dead, and he literally gives you his life, his power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? So now you can create the future together. The work of Jesus was meant to disconnect you from living focused on the past and to connect you to living instead for the future. That's why baptism is such a great physical expression of that spiritual reality that when you believe that Jesus is your savior when you've opened up and surrendered your life to him to allow him to lead you that baptism is the expression that I've died I'm under the water my sins are washed away and when you come up out of the water you're saying just as Jesus has been raised from the dead I too have been raised to live a new life it's 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 a it's a very physical tangible way for you to access a spiritual truth that now you can be more committed to the future than you are to the past. What about you? Are you more committed to the future or are you more committed to the past? Do you take your your loneliness and are you going back and allowing the past to drag you back and to try to deal with your loneliness in ways that just drag you down? Are you, are you doing your dating life the way you used to, or are you living and doing it a new way? Are you, are you making decisions based on where you want to go in life, where you believe God wants you to be, or are you making decisions based on a pattern and a dysfunction and a cycle that is just a perpetuation of what happened in your family? Are you more committed to the future, or are you more committed to the past? Jesus Put it this way, he said, anybody who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit 
for the kingdom of God. He, you know why? Because you can't create the future if you're focused on your past. You can't create the future. Plowing requires you to focus and to look far ahead and to move in that direction. You can't plow a straight line if all you're doing is living with a constant sense of regret, if all you're doing is repeating the same unhealthy, sinful patterns that have marked your past. Jesus said you can't go forward and create the future if you turn back and you are trying to get something out of your past. Listen, when God calls you to a new level of leadership, to a new level of influence, and you feel overwhelmed by that, are you more focused on the future or are you more longing for when everything was so much easier? And instead of rising to the occasion and letting God stretch you and grow you, are you instead looking for the easy way out? Are you more committed to your future? Or are you more committed to your past? Jesus took the disciples and they actually were hanging out in church. They literally, I mean, they were like sitting up in a balcony, watching, looking at people, kind of doing it. You guys ever people watch in church? It's creepy. It's creepy, but we all do it, right? <laughs> and, and, and people are like, you know, they would line up and, and they would take their, their money and they would drop it in the coffers and there were people with these beautiful robes and well-dressed and make sure that their coins make lots of noise when they drop it in. And, and, and people are just kind of watching everything happening. Jesus is, and his disciples are kind of looking at all this. And then this black and white pencil sketch of a woman, a widow who is barely noticeable, in between everybody else, she walks up and she, she drops coins and you could barely hear it. And Jesus, in watching this with his disciples in, in Luke 21, in verse 3, he said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they've given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given Everything she has. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how Jesus always sees what nobody else sees? Isn't that wonderful? He does that here too. He sees what nobody else sees. And, and you go, what would make somebody, what would make a widow give everything she has? What would make her so quietly let go like that? Here's what I could tell you. She's committed more to the future than she is to the past. She's more committed to what she has to look forward to than what she even has. She's more committed to what God is going to do in her life looking forward than anything in her past. That's what happens when you're committed more to the future than to the past. It shows up in generosity. Here, here's the truth, guys. Listen. Debt, when you're drowning in debt, it keeps you chained to your past. Generosity is how you commit yourself to the future. Because now it's about what you're looking forward to, what you're investing in. Now it's, now it's looking forward to the future that you're creating through your giving. That's why things like getting in a financial freedom group, if like you've got so much debt, if you've got those issues, get into a financial freedom group. And here's the key that you'll find, is that even before you take care of all the chains of debt, the key to begin breaking it is actually to begin to practice generosity. When we talk about things like, like giving the, to help the people in Puerto Rico when we feed the 2,000 children in Swaziland, which we're doing, and all those things, those happen because people are living more for the future and are committed to the future more than they're committed to the past. When you, when you do relationships, are you stuck in a cycle of bitterness where you keep reminding yourself how somebody hurt you, how nobody knows about it, how you want everybody to see how deeply you were wronged? In your relationships, when you live committed to the past, that's what it looks like. And the only way to become committed to the future is by forgiving Saying, I don't want to live in the past anymore. I don't want to be, I don't want to live by how people define me or how I have defined myself. I can't do that anymore. And sometimes the way that you find the ability to commit yourself to the future is by asking for forgiveness from somebody that you've hurt. Because you've chained yourself 
to them and the past by what you've done? Are you more committed to the future than you are to the past? Are you more committed to your future with God than you are to your past that you lived without him? When you begin dating, are you doing it in a way that looks different than the way you used to do it because now you know Jesus and you trust him? You see, that's what it looks like to be more committed to the future. Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow but you keep looking back, you won't be able to create the future. You'll be stuck plowing crooked rows and you won't be fit for what it is that God wants to create in your life. And so you got to look ahead. You got to look forward. You got to keep dealing with stuff so you can continue to move forward. You begin to practice generosity because you've made a decision. I'm committing myself to live for the future instead of committed to the past. It says in verse 5 that some of his disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. So they're sitting in church, you're like, oh man, check out those lights. Woo, cool. Look at the beams. Look at that sound system. That was expensive. Wow. And they're looking around and they're just taking a look. And I don't know what the memorial decorations were. Like, I wonder were they like, you know, pictures, drawings, paintings of stories out of the Bible? Was it, were they like memorials saying, ah, oh, this person gave so much to our cause? Was it remembering people? You know, we know this, that Herod, King Herod, built the temple, really made it lavish, like really fancy. And he did it not because he cared so much about the worship of God. He did it because he cared about looking politically legitimate to the Jewish people. And so he's like, if I can create a building program, people can have jobs, and we'll have this amazing place, and they will all approve of me. That's what Herod's motive was. And the disciples are sitting there, and they're like, whoa, this place is so cool. And look what Jesus says. Again, he sees what nobody else sees. But Jesus said, the time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. You're so impressed by what you see with your eyes. Jesus was looking 70 years into the future when the Romans would dismantle all of it. And Jesus is saying, you're so impressed by what you see, but you don't understand that the future that I'm creating with you is not about buildings. It's not about that at all. Take a look at what he, what he, what he says. He says, hey, who do people say I am in Matthew 16? Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And I say that about you, you have said something about me, that I am the Messiah, the son of the living God. He says, you're Peter, rock, but on the rock of what you said about me, I will build my church. And all the powers of Hell will not conquer it. He say, you guys are, you guys think that the church is about a building. It's about people. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to do such a work in people's lives of forgiving them and of coming into their lives. I'm going to create the future with them that is going to be so powerful that death and hell will not stand up against it. That's what he said. He says, Get your eyes off of the stuff. Get it on people. And it's always got to be about people. Listen, even when we build buildings, even when we remodel, when we create inviting environments, we're not just building stuff. It's creating inviting environments where people can find hope. It's always about the people. When we became the Bridge Church 10 years ago, one of the things that we did is when you see all of the stonework that's here in all, and around us, is we had people come up and write the names of people that they're praying for on the back of these stones. All of these stones have people's names written on the back. I remember the day when a woman was baptized here, someone came up to me after the service and said, that woman used to be my neighbor. I wrote her name on the back of the stone. Today we baptized her. It's always about people. 
It's always about people. When we build spaces, when we remodel spaces, it's never about, wow, isn't this impressive? It's always going to be about creating inviting environments where people can find hope. And when churches get off track, and when businesses get off track, when businesses are like, we've got the secret sauce, we know how to do this, everybody just needs to learn from us, and they're so busy patting themselves on the back, somebody's innovating the next thing and going, I don't even need a building, I'll just use the internet. Churches, what happens is things that were strategies at one time end up becoming institutions. So one of the great outreach strategies that happened coming out of the Industrial Revolution, children were working in factories. You guys read your history books, right? So somebody said this, kids aren't getting an education. They're never going to be able to break free. And so here's what we're going to do on Sundays when the kids aren't working. We're actually going to teach them how to read and we're going to teach them how to write. And we're going to sit down and we're going to give them an education. We're going to use the Bible because we want to give them hope as well. And it was a strategy to reach people. And it was an effective strategy. But over time, it became an institution within the church. And suddenly people were like, don't take away Sunday school from me. It's us four and no more. We like it this way. And what had become a strategy, what was once a strategy, had morphed into an institution. And churches die when that happens. Let me tell you something. You look at all the, like, majestic cathedrals that are in Europe. You want to know what's happening to a lot of the cathedrals in Europe? Some of them are being converted into nightclubs. Why? Because there are no people there anymore. One of the biggest moves is happening in Germany. In Germany, the Muslims are buying up the churches and they're holding services in the Christian churches. What's happening? When a church becomes more about the past than being committed to the future, when a church stops innovating, when a church stops changing, when a church church stops doing those things and they become all about preserving what they already have They become an institution. They stop being about the people. They start being about other things, and they die. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we read this, the thing that I have to ask myself is, hey, are we as a community going to be more committed to the future than we are to the past? Listen, it's been 10 years that we've been the Bridge Church. It's been 10 years. It was a... And, and before then, I w- so here, here's the deal. Ten years ago, when we became the Bridge Church, that was like a big deal. It was like a big deal. I, I, I did some math. First service, I got the math wrong. Because I'm the Asian guy without the math chip. <laughs> it isn't fair, but I'm not bitter. One bit. And I started in this role when I was 38 years old. 15 years ago. I was here 11 years before them volunteering on core team. That's what I did. I mean, all this. And, and we look back and there is a lot to celebrate. There's a lot to go woohoo about about the past 10 years and what led up to those 10 years. But I can tell you, I, I, I love it. I celebrate it. I honor the contribution that people have made. And I know what it took for us to get to where we are. But I can tell you, I'm much more committed to the future than I am to the past. And I think the best is yet to come. And so you're going to see some things that we're changing. We're going to be hiring in some crucial uh, decisions, adding staff that's going to help us to focus more and more on the next generation to be able to create the kind of a place where we're setting up the next generation to succeed and to create the future with God. That's our place. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see some things happen. At a certain point, we need all of the portable children's spaces to go away, and we need to build a state-of-the-art children's facility. We've got to do that. Why? Because we want to impress people? No. Because we've got to create inviting environments where children can find hope. And we need to do that, being committed to the future together. That's such an important part. We've got to be so much more committed to the future than committed to the past. And here's the truth, guys. Everyone, amen, woohoo, we're happy, we're excited. But something happens when I start to put out a call for the investment. People that like love the vitality of 
church and love the vitality of community and love all that stuff, something happens when you start asking people to give sacrificially. You begin to find out who's more committed to the future or who's committed to the past. And we have to say we are committed more to the future than we are to the past. And when we are called upon to make the sacrifices, the reason that we can do it is because we have made up our minds what we're about. And at 10 years, great, awesome. But there's a part that says, so what? Where are we going? And that's where I am. And once we knew, once we knew that God was saying, hey, you guys, time to move forward. As a, as a body of believers, we went, we're all in, all of us. We just went all in with that. And so this is, this is what I want to challenge you to do. When you look at your schedule, where can you see that you're more committed to the future than you are to the past? Where do you see yourself making investments? When you look at your checkbook, where do you see yourself being more committed to the future than you are to the past? In the way that you handle your finances, where does that show up? In the way that you do relationships, where do you show that you are more committed to the future, creating a future with God, than you are to living in the past the way you used to? Is it showing up in your life? Because that's what it looks like when you follow Jesus Christ. And it's the very possibility that he opens up. It's the very reason he did what he did, is to unchain us from everything that dragged us down, to forgive us and to love us and to lead us into a future that he wants to create with us by the power of his love living in us. It's the very thing that he came for. One of the things that happens when you start to be more committed to the future than you are to the past is life and joy. You get up and you are looking forward to what is coming. You have something that you're looking forward to. Your investments keep you connected to the future. And you stay focused in that way. One of the, one of the best things that I ever did in, in, in my time here, when I first started coming here. So this was, we're talking, okay, like 1990. Okay. I know, I feel old. I feel old. And, but here's the deal. You know, one of the things that I did in the beginning was I worked with children. And it was one of the most wonderful experiences. As a matter of fact, all of the key male leaders in this church were involved in children's ministry. All of them. Because for the men, there, we carried within us the desire to create a future for the kids, where kids that didn't have dads had positive male role models to look to. And it was so important. Can I tell you, it's even more important today, and can I tell you that we have fewer men in children's ministry engaging. Men, I need you to engage. I need you to commit yourself to the future. And here's what happens. When, when men and women choose to commit themselves more to the future than to the past. You're going to experience joy. You have fun. God like meets you right in that space. And so let me just let me just show you just a glimpse of actually what this looks like when you're working with kids. Take a look. tell you what is really cool is we see some of the kids that we invested in and some of those kids are in ministry today some of them are leaders in a church here some of them are leaders in churches elsewhere we've seen that the investment that we made that we literally helped to create the future by that investment and i love that that just gets me fired up you guys And so here's what I'm looking for. Just in the area of children's ministry alone, I want to see 30 people that say, I want to create the future. I want kids in this world that is being so distorted, in this world where there's so much bad news, I want to be a part of creating a future for them with God where they can believe 
God for great things to look ahead to. I want to be able to be a part of seeing that happen. We have to ask ourselves, are we more committed to the future or preserving the past where we sit on the sidelines? Are we more committed to making a difference in children's lives or are we more committed to just staying comfortable? Are we going to be more committed when a time comes to build buildings and create inviting environments where people can find hope or are we going to be more committed to hanging on to what we have? Are we going to be more committed to building teams and investing in young people and watching them rise up and setting them up for success than we are preserving our own place? Are we going to be more about them spreading their wings and innovating right here? Or are we going to be more about holding on to control? That's something I have to ask myself. And I can tell you where I'm at. I want to see what God does to the next generation. I'm uncertain when we're going to build buildings. I am uncertain about who's going to end up on the team. I'm uncertain about the timing of so many things. But this is something that I'm absolutely 100% certain about. Here's what I'm certain about. That God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is fully finished. And here's what that means. We're not finished yet. There's still more work to be done. And so that's what we're going to do. How do we learn to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference? We do that by always looking to the future and spending our time, our resources, more committed to the future than we are to the past. And that's something that we're going to get to do together, and it's something that God is going to do right here through all of us. Are you with us on that? Are we together on that? Okay. Then I want to do something. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you would, because here's what I know. I know that in a, in a crowd this size, that some of you, you hear things like that, and you go, that sounds awesome. I'm so excited about that, but God couldn't do that through me. You don't know me, Pastor. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how many times I've done it. You don't know how dark my past is. You don't know all that I carry. You don't know me. And you're right. I don't. But Jesus does. And all he wants to do is forgive you for everything. And he knows everything so you can be relieved. When he says, I'm going to forgive you for everything, he forgives you for everything, even the things that you did that you don't remember. And if you surrender your life to him, He's going to break you away from your past. And he's going to bring you into a new life where you are committed to the future and where he will create the future with you. Only this time, it'll be with his power in your life and his leadership leading you. And he dreams about what he's going to do through you. Stop disqualifying yourself from God's love. Stop it. Stop committing yourself to the past like that. Today, let Christ start something new in your life. Give you a whole new life. And he'll start it with the work within you from the inside out. And with your eyes closed, if today you go, that's exactly what I want. And I'm not going disqualify, not gonna to disqualify myself anymore. I'm not going to live in the past anymore. I want, to, I want to be free. I want to step into the future with Jesus. I want to see what that life is like. I want to see what his power is like. I want to place my faith in him. I want to be forgiven. If that's you, with your eyes closed, you just put your hand up in the air. And this is going to be the beginning of a new day for you. This is the beginning of a new life for you. You never, you never have to... You never have to make this declaration, but it'll be a life of surrender. Will you continue to follow? This is it. I'm going to ask you to, you guys can put your hands down. I don't want anybody to be afraid. You exist because God decided the world was a better place with you than it ever would have been without you. 
but he wants to forgive you and plug you in to his plan for your life. And so for those of you that want to take that step and begin that journey right where you are, you can pray, and you can pray something like this between you and him. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. And so I ask you, forgive me for all of my sins. I turn away from living that way. And I ask you now to come into my life by the power of your Holy Spirit. I believe you're alive and I want you in my life, Lord. From this day forward, I want to create the future that you created me for. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And with your eyes still closed, for many of you, you you've taken steps of faith. You've taken steps of baptism. But the being committed to the future, it, it doesn't show up in your resources. It doesn't show up in your schedule. And you can't wander into building a legacy. You've got to be intentional about it. It's not just going to be something you stumble into. It's something that you set your mind to. And there's some changes that you can make. You begin to serve a children's ministry or come to growth track today and begin that journey. But whatever you do, don't let it be an accident. Begin to create the future with your Lord and your Savior. So Lord, thank you so much. It was the very reason you came. And even when people were marveling at buildings, Lord, you were already looking to the church, the people that you were going to build against which hell and death could not prevail. So, Lord, thank you that we get to live our lives with the power of an indestructible life, knowing you, making a difference, all of those things, God. We love you for it. And we're so glad that you are our Savior and that you are our Lord. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Let's give it up for God, you guys. <laughs>